Hello, and welcome to the Zach's Friday Finish Line. I'm Ryan McQueenie, a content writer here at Zach's, along with one of our editors, Maddie Johnson. Hi, how are Hi. you today? I'm fantastic, as always. Awesome. Today is Friday, August 19th, and we're re here to recap this week's biggest stories. So, we're going to be taking a look at the state of the retail shopping landscape after two giants in the sector, Target and Walmart, reported earnings this week. But uh, before we jump into that, Let's talk about uh, how one big decision from some federal officials this week will change the shape of one industry forever. That's exactly right, Ryan. Um, so those federal officials were the Department of Justice, and that industry is the private prison business. Um, so the U.S. Department of Justi Justice, or the DOJ, mm -hmm. announced plans on Thursday to phase out the use of private prisons, which are for-profit prisons, um, so that will effectively kill the federally funded wing of the private correctional services industry after concluding that the facilities were both less safe and less effective than their government-run counterparts. Um, it's also, I want to point out, that this is not going to affect state-run prisons, mm -hmm. which they also have a lot of for-profit prisons in that industry, but this is only going to affect federally-run prisons. So just contracts with the federal government. Right. Um, so there are currently 13 privately run facilities, and these facilities house just over 22,000 inmates. And I was looking at a map, and there are five in Texas, which, not surprised, but I thought it was interesting. Hey, everything's bigger in Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. Including crime, I guess. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so these 13 facilities um, are in the Federal Bureau of Prison System. And then Yates, which is the, so Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates said that the Justice Department will not terminate any of, it, any of its existing contracts, but instead it will kind of wean itself out of these contracts. Right. So they won't renew them when they, when they, when they expire. Right. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's what I thought was, a, I guess, probably the easiest way to go about it legally, because there's yeah, always definitely. certainly ramifications when you... Uh, when you break a contract, yeah. Um, so yeah, like you like you said, they're just letting them expire. Kind of and apparently, the contracts off. for all thirteen of these facilities that are in the Bureau of Prison System will be up for renewal within the next five years. Right. So th theoretically, five years from now, all the contracts should be done, and that should be the kind of the complete end of the federal government working with these private prison right. operators. Um, so two big names in that industry, so Corrections Corporation of America, which trades at CXW, and the GEO Group, which also which trades at GEO. Mm -hmm. They both fell about 38% on Thursday. It halted um, briefly even. Yeah. So volatility, is, it was crazy. Very crazy. Um, but I also have a question on where these 22,000 inmates will Are go. Are going to go, yeah. Um, I have that question too. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a small sum of people. That's quite a big, that's a large population. Yeah, and it's not like you ever hear about prisons having tons of room for more no. inmates to come yeah. in. So definitely will be interesting to yeah. see where the heck all these people go. Right. I'm, not my job. So. Not your job, <laughs> but definitely interesting to think about. There um, are people who are working on that diligently right now. Fingers I'm crossed. Sure. Yes. <laughs> um, so. Now we'll transition to another kind of industry, but associated with the government. So he, two huge federal stories. Um, true. This week. I didn't so even think about it like that. Yeah. It's very true. So the health insurance industry kind of went through a shakeup this week as it attempts to deal with the changes caused by Obamacare. Yeah. So big, obviously, you know, the implementation of Obamacare has really just changed the whole landscape of that kind of health insurance, health coverage. Uh, world and uh, you know we're finding it uh, or it's becoming a little bit more clear that insurance companies are struggling to turn profits on their Obamacare exchanges right. um, so this week Aetna which uh, trades under the ticker AET um, one of the larger uh, health insurance providers um, was the latest in what is becoming a list of these major mm -hmm. insurance providers, uh, including United Healthcare Group and Humana, uh, deciding to scale back drastically their uh, offerings within that within the Obamacare system within the, that exchange. Yeah. So, um, 
Aetna is deciding to stop it, it comp the, just stop offering these plans in 11 of the 15 states where it was participating um, and is reducing its overall participation from 778 counties to 242 counties so in it seems 2017. like drastic is quite the understatement. Yeah, drastic even could be an understatement. Yeah. I mean, almost eliminating it, I yeah. guess. Um, so this comes after, a, a few weeks after their most recent earnings report, mm -hmm. um, in which they, you know, looking forward, said that they plan to lose, or they don't plan to, but they expect to lose about $300 million on their Obamacare business this year. It's a big chunk. Yeah, that's a big chunk. And, and this was a company that beat earnings. So this, mm -hmm. was, this was a company that didn't necessarily have a poor earnings report, but was like, we, hey, we, it could have been this much better if we could make any money on these these people. Right. And so we're seeing insurance providers um, struggle to turn profits with these plans because the people who are purchasing these plans are getting more sick and are more expensive mm -hmm. to cover than people with employer plans. So, right. so yeah, I actually have the figure here. People who are covered under Obamacare plans more prone to serious diseases and on average cost 22% more per month to, to cover than those with employer plans. So that's, you know, that's no small figure that, that they're seeing consistently across the board. Um, people buying these Obamacare offerings are just more expensive to cover. Um, these companies are kind of lobbying the government to uh, raise premiums next year. Um, but for now, in a lot of counties, the, the options are slowly Slim. dwindling, which obviously, you know, for the consumer, you, you in almost any business, you'd like to see options that yeah. typically helps with costs and uh, consumer behavior. Um, and, I mean, these people that are more, like, the people who are purchasing, purchasing these plans, they, yes, they are more expensive to cover, but they are the ones that seemingly need health insurance the most, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, for me, that's frustrating to see that. Right. That Edna yeah. is pulling out. Yeah. I, I, it's a I, little I, bit of a juxtaposition, if you will. Yeah, it's definitely um, an interesting point that we're getting to. Um, I, I, it'd be really interesting to talk to, um, this is going to really blow your mind here. Really interesting to talk to President Obama about it would this. Be, <laughs> be interesting would to talk to President Obama just in general, but it would be interesting to see how he feels about um, what I'm assuming is an unintended consequence yeah. of this bill. This bill that now uh, bears his name mm -hmm. uh, in common terms. So I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what the future holds. Um, obviously, I think both presidential candidates uh, are calling for health care reform. Definitely. Um, it, that's going to look very different, obviously, based on um, who gets elected and what Congress looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it could be anything from a repeal of Obamacare to a expansion, a public option, a lot of things that could happen. Yeah, so, definitely. Um, something probably will change uh, sooner rather than later because, you know, I don't think that any proponent of health care reform wants citizens in, you know, these smaller, more rural areas having one option and one option only. So um, certainly not good for business, certainly not good for the consumer. Yeah. So, so yeah, as promised, uh, we will get into some major retail so stocks in a bit. Um, but first, I want to check in on everyone's favorite private company, which is now just how I'm introducing it every time I talk about it, <laughs> because it's I, what I've de deemed to be the truth. So yes. everyone's favorite private company right now, and that is the ride-hailing extraordinaires over at Uber. Oh, Uber. Just always keeping it interesting. So maybe we should have like every we should have a new intro for when we talk about Uber and we should do it every week because it seems like Uber comes up a lot for us. Almost on a, like a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So on Thursday, the company said it would be taking legal action against Transport for London, mm -hmm. which is the city's transport regulator. 
and they want to block upcoming regulatory changes that would hinder the recruitment of new drivers. This is a, yeah, we, so let's talk about these changes because this is a doozy. This one, yeah. this one made me scratch my head when I, when <laughs> So I one of the new requirements for drivers includes passing a written English language test to operate a private for hire vehicle, mm -hmm. as well as English writing skills. Makes sense, I guess. TFL wants to modernize the right. the whole for for hire taxi industry in London. Mm -hmm. So these private hire firms must also run a London call center, mm -hmm. and drivers are required to have insurance for their vehicles, even when even when they are not being used as private hire cars. So, were these regulations? attempts to modernize the industry in London or were they attempts to push Uber out of well, the that's, industry? That's the real London? question. Um, it just, it seems the one that very fickle and very specific. And definitely something that is going to have some legal pushback. So yeah. Uber is the one kind of taking it to the legal world taking the legal action against um, this TFL, but it seems like something that would obviously raise some in, some, some legal question marks. Legal the, questions the, and ethical the, questions. Yeah, the, the one that jumps out to the page for me <laughs> is definitely the passing a written English test, uh, written English language test to operate a vehicle, I mean, and English writing skills. I'm not sure what how the English writing skills apply to Driving. can I get to, from point A to point B safely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would so, in yes. researching this story, I was reading an article by Quartz, mm -hmm. and they cite Uber as saying that these regulations are more difficult than the, the citizenship test for Britain. Okay. Which may be an over-exaggeration, but I think they do raise an interesting perspective. Yeah, also like, I, I, I don't know. I know a lot of, I, know, I feel like I know a lot of people that would struggle with any level of an English language yeah, written not test. Yeah, not the easiest, <laughs> not the easiest language to learn. And I just don't see what it has to do with no. driving so cars So I think safely, Uber so. does have some right to be a little bit outraged. Sure, um, sure. And this is coming from someone I completely understand the regulatory pushback that Uber has received in most cases. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it's pretty reasonable for these kind of regulatory bodies to try to level the playing field a mm -hmm. little bit uh, for these other, the traditional taxi services yeah. um, against Uber. Uh, this, on the other hand, does not seem that fair to me, but that's just not fair for opinion. Uber, but also not fair for drivers who want to make a little bit of money on the side yeah. and maybe doesn't speak English, English that well. Well, yeah, if, I, don't, I don't know. So, but moving on to a lighter announcement from the company, Uber has acquired self-driving car startup Auto. Mm -hmm. um, so this company specializes in self-driving trucks. Um, it's a 90-person company and its co-founder. Anthony Lewandowski, if mm -hmm. I'm saying that right, he will now lead Uber in into the self-driving car market, so he will head Uber's self-driving car initiatives sure. from now on. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so if all of the deal's key goals are met, the acquisition could potentially be worth 1% of Uber's current valuation, which is, I believe, is $68 billion. Okay. Um, and that's a whopping 680 million. Quite the paycheck for such Quite a, the paycheck. a small company. And like I think that. that Uber, I think it's taking on all of Auto's workforce. So I don't think they're, I'm not sure if any cuts are being made, being made but I think they're going to kind sure. of just kind of scoop them all into Uber. That's good. Which is pretty cool. That's yeah. interesting. And this is not necessarily Uber's first foray into the no. self-driving car market. We uh, heard about them partnering with Carnegie Mellon, I believe, was the Yeah, school? they have a, I think they have a firm or a research institute in Pittsburgh, Yeah, they I were believe. driving around four yeah. fusions. Yeah. Yeah. This week, too, I think they just launched a new fleet. Interesting. So Interesting. Definitely, Uber is definitely becoming a big competitor to so Google. So, eventually, 
is the robot driving the car going to have to pass an English written <laughs> test before it can pick well, me up in London? If robots turn into fully functioning AI entities, because now I'm seeing, maybe I'm now I'm seeing in a world for Uber where this English language test doesn't really matter because there's no driver in the car. Exactly. So, so no more lawsuits. Yeah, and, either. I, and something interesting about this self-driving car world is these headlines are becoming more and more frequent about these big name companies investing mm -hmm. in self-driving vehicles, testing out self-driving vehicles, Tesla launching their autopilot last year. This is creeping up on people. And I think that it could surprise some folks just how quick this is going to You're be, gonna be able to, like, a reality. Yeah, yeah a, a, a reality and a, a cultural norm. So. Exactly. Like, oh, do you want just your conventional, traditional car? Or look what we have. You can just get a car where you can be in your phone and drive for you. know, it'll and, and obviously you. it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to note how the government goes about regulating that, mm -hmm. um, and you know how long it takes manufacturers to get this technology into cars at a, a price level that is affordable yeah. for. Um, the everyday um, The person. everyday consumer. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll see. And, and, yeah. and Uber, uh, Uber will be at the uh, forefront of that revolution. So, all right, I think we'll move on now to the earnings. Earnings, yes. <laughs> so um, first we'll look at Target. Um, this, we're kind of coming up on the, I feel like I've been saying for the past two or three weeks now that we're coming up on the end of this er earnings yeah. <laughs> season. Yeah, this past week has been busy. But There's always I mean, earnings reports. Always but, earnings. Um, this one, this last week was more of a, there was several big retail It was like the second wave companies. of them, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, we saw these kind of big value stores like Target uh, being the first one we'll look at uh, report this week. So uh, they announced second quarter results on Wednesday morning. Um, they posted earnings of $1.23 per share, uh, beating our Zach's consensus estimate of $1.14. Um, despite that earnings beat, however, Target missed revenue expectations. Um, so the company saw quarterly revenues of $16.169 billion. Um, falling short of our estimate of 16.24 billion, um, and that that those revenue struggles were brought on by weak um, comparable store sales. Mm -hmm. um, so comps were down about 1.1 percent in the quarter, um, and just overall less people in the stores. It looks like um, total transactions were down 2.2 percent. Um, and the, the most interesting thing to me about Wednesday for Target was the earnings conference call where executives took to the phone to explain why comps were so weak this quarter. And they pointed at some, uh, it, some interesting reasons um, and three specifically notable things. They kind of they said this is problem one, two, and three. <laughs> um, and so the first was overall electronic sales. They saw a double-digit decline in electronic sales, wow. which was driven by a 20% decline in sales of Apple products. Um, it's very, like a very specific yes. culprit. A very specific culprit and also not great news for Apple. No. Um, <laughs> Does this, I mean, this so, can't mean people don't want Apple products. Well, it certainly means they're not going to Target to buy them. Yeah. Um, Apple has, you know, been struggling over the last couple of quarters with iPhone sales and whatnot. It's, it's been something that we're talking about now for, for really the first time ever. Right. Um, maybe just the norm was consistent growth in iPhone sales, and now that is not the norm anymore. Mm -hmm. um, all we know other than that 20% decline is that Target is working with Apple to work on strategies on how to increase sales um, so it might be a way that it might be how their marketing is contributing to it yeah um, which it certainly implies a loss of demand for Apple products though yeah you know it target is one of them is a big big chain um, within electronics you know it's not like they have 
a weak electronics section. You, it's no. going to Target to get your electronics is certainly yeah. a viable option. But look at but like going. So when I go into a, my local Target, their Apple section, it's not. It's not like it's marketed yeah. to the full extent that it could be. So if you think of Best Buy and how they set up like their sure, laptops and sure. they have like a huge Apple section, right? That could be something that Target could look at doing or mimicking. Yeah, trying to create this more well-defined area for Apple shopping. Yeah, and it, those are the types of things I'm assuming they're talking with Apple about. Yeah. Those are the types of kind of strategies Apple I think would be suggesting. Um, interestingly enough, that we bring up marketing though, because they also blamed marketing for the, another one of the reasons that they saw comps were down, which was weak sales of groceries overall. Which is not new for Target. Sure, so uh, obviously Target, you can walk in and get a, just about everything, mm -hmm. um, which is also the case with Walmart, which we'll talk about in a second, but uh, yeah, they blamed uh, just weak grocery sales, and um, they, they kind of, said that it, it will, this weak grocery sales issue is causing them to rebalance, I think was the word they used, rebalance their promotions and marketing and stuff because they felt that the pay less portion of the expect more pay less was getting lost on people. And gotcha. so they, they really needed to reinvigorate that aspect. So of, it was not low enough. Right. So I don't know. I... I, I I don't know where Target ranks on the how people perceive the value shopping options. Um, I've certainly heard some jokes that uh, you pay a little bit more to go to Target so that you don't have to go to Walmart for the people who aren't fans of shopping at Walmart. I've heard that too, yeah. Um, but expect more pay less is the tagline. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe trying to refocus on that pay less as they said. So, um, and then the other, the final, the third thing was uh, they partner. They recently partnered up with CVS pharmacies gotcha. to put CVS pharmacies into Target stores. Right, I have noticed that. And they said that that partnership is off to a slow start. Mm -hmm. um, customers are not signing up for the deals and promotions at a very high rate at all with the CVSs. Um, I see. As a slight, they, I think they kind of justified that as saying, "This is a big partnership. It takes." a lot of time for customers to adjust to this new thing in the stores. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think slower than expected start was kind of what's going on with that. Gotcha. Um, so those would be the three areas looking forward that Target could improve on. And definitely a mixed bag of results from them this week, um, which I think was also the case for Walmart. Yeah, so for Walmart's second quarter of its fiscal 2017, um, it posted earnings of $1.07 per share on revenue of $120.9 billion. Mm -hmm. um, Walmart beat out the Zach's estimate by $0.05 cents for its bottom line, while its revenue figure grew 0.5% year over year, and also beat our estimate by 0.7%. Um, so despite these beats, they did see declines in international sales and at Sam's Club, which is a similar to Costco. It's a wholesale... Uh, retailer, um, but these were mostly offset by strong growth in its Walmart, in its uh, United States division. Um, so these beats, I think it's a good sign for Walmart as they kind of move into e-commerce, mm -hmm. um, as they're able to balance out the costs that come with building a strong online presence with growing their brick and mortar um, retail sales. Definitely something that we look to with the earnings figure because yeah. that's where we see, okay, how well are we turning profits? And I think that's the main concern with when you invest so much in e-commerce as they have is, all right, well, is this cutting into profits? Right. And so for them to be able to post an earnings beat um, is a good indicator that they are still, you know, turning good solid profits yeah um, um, so looking ahead its guidance for its next quarter they expect earnings in the range of 90 cents to one dollar per share but that would be down from the comparable quarters earnings of a dollar oh three per share but it's also in line with our estimate of 94 cents per share um, and that's the going back to what I just said I guess is kind of the 
the mixed signals aspect of it yeah is that yeah they posted this earnings beat but now you know looking forward we're looking at you know a 10 percent ish decline in earnings yeah uh year over year uh for the third quarter if they're if they're able to fall in that range that they kind of announced for themselves this week um which is why I think, you know, the stock gained about a one and a half percent. I think right immediately after the report, because they think looking at earnings revenue beats, that's good news. Um, the market's going to react positively to that, but I don't think investors were too blown away by the guidance in no. the report. And I'm not sure investors. I mean, for the last few quarters, I'm not sure if Walmart has managed to blow away. The, their its shareholders. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this is these re results are good, but almost to be expected and nothing to get too excited about. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll also have to look at next quarter how Jet's, I mean Walmart's purchase of Jet.com will influence True. its performance and especially sure. its um, its comps. Yeah, and uh, looking at again that's a big thing with e-commerce how much business is that going to bring in right um on with online shopping um and how much of a presence how much of a market share in this e-commerce world are they going to have over amazon yeah um and i will have to say something about walmart's website is i do think it's manageable and i do think it's easy to navigate and to find the things that you want which is kind of the opposite of going back to Target. Their website and their online presence is not good, mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely something that they should could improve could on. improve a should lot on. and definitely funnel some funds into kind of creating creating and expanding that presence. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I think. Taking a step back just to talk because this these two two massive chains like this. Um, are going to paint a good picture of the state of retail, which also talks of, it isn't you know the end all be all, but it definitely is a statement about the the overall health of the economy. Definitely, um, you know these are the types of places that are going to see the consequences um, or effects of consumers even either having a lot of money to spend or not having a lot of money mm -hmm. to spend. Um, so when we see something like Walmart uh, beating earnings, beating revenue, um, and, and saying, hey, we had strong growth in the US division, that's at least telling us something about the fact that US customers are going to Walmart to shop and they're doing it um, at a level that's resulting in, in, in good results for Walmart. Um, and good, strong growth, as the company said in the earnings report. Um, a decline in international sales might say the opposite about the state of the global, the global economy, economy um, and, and might kind of um, kind of reinforce what we've been saying almost all year now, which is there's a lot of uncertainty in the global economy. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, looking at target missing revenue expectations it doesn't we don't have this universal agreement um, and we kind of have to look at reasons like target pointed to for why they saw weak sales this quarter yeah and go okay so do any of these things that target pointed to say anything about just the overall behavior of consumers Right now, and I think the only thing I can think of that applies across the board is this decline in Apple sale in sales of Apple products. Um, when we talk about consumer, you know, they're they're not selling as many groceries because they're not marketing very well. That's not that's a company specific issue. Yeah. Um, their partnership with CVS Pharmacy is a company specific issue. Um, so definitely interesting to note. Um, it's definitely not like a giant green light saying. The retail it's landscape back. is great. <laughs> um, it's it's not saying that it's you know it's also not a huge it's also not a very bad sign for the retail right. landscape. You know it's it's uh, like I said a mixed bag of results this week, um, and definitely you know now we have several things we can keep our eye on going forward for both of these companies and that overall uh, behavior of consumers right now. Um, yeah, and so with that. Uh, 
basically everything we have this week. Um, as yeah, always, you can find the links to the articles, uh, or the links to all of our coverage in the articles. And uh, as always, thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Yeah, thank you.